I'm Tom Ray. And this is American Bandito. So there are a couple things I'd like to say before today's show. One, if you've ever been wondering why the episodes say that it's season one, that's because when I first started, I didn't know if I was going to continue to do this. I didn't know if it was even going to work. So when I did my call out for Artists in Madison, I figured that would be a way to end it. As I was posting these shows, I got to relive what happened each time I met those people. And every time I'd be like, oh, that's my favorite episode. And then I'd do the next one and I'd go, oh, that's my favorite. Well, they were all my favorite. I didn't even know what the show was going to be like. I didn't really know what I was going to do yet. I kind of just winged it. And as it went along, it kind of structured itself. It also gave me an idea for season two. So after today's episode, there's going to be a short break. I'm hoping it's a short break. And this time around, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get it from the angle of the people that help promote the art in Madison, help display it help sell it. So I've been talking to shops, galleries, just stores of any sort that kind of support local art or people who do it. And much like recording this first season, it's been kind of a trip. But that's what you can expect for the next one. And I hope to have it out by November. I know, but that's what I'm shooting for. I think it's going to be a very insightful thing to listen to. And another thing I'd like to point out Some people have asked me, why did I decide to make a podcast for a show about art? It's because it's not really about the artwork. The whole thing is about meeting people in the community. The knowledge that I've acquired just from going out and meeting the select few people that have been on this show has really turned my summer around immensely. How many of you, after listening to an episode, have said, I'm going to go check that person's stuff out? Now, whether you liked what they made or not, You actively went to go seek out that person that you just listened to because they made you curious. And I think that's the important part of this entire thing. Now today we meet someone whose career started out by winning a contest. That contest turned into a job. That job turned into teaching. And what she learned from all that, she took and started doing it all for herself. It was kind of like on-the-job personal training. So listen all about it as I meet Stephanie Heyman. Right now you're out in Sun Prairie, but were you always from Sun Prairie? No, actually, we just moved here about eight years ago. I grew up in central Illinois, so in a little town called Princeton, like kind of between Chicago and the Quad Cities off of I-80. So I'm a central Illinois girl and then moved to Chicago for about 10 years and then took a job in Madison and we moved up here about eight years ago. Okay. So, yeah, it's a little different. I grew up in a really small town of like 7,000 people uh-huh. and then I went to college and then my first job was in the city. So I got really used to it. So it was a bit of a change to come back to a smaller setting, but I really was excited to do it. My husband is Chicago born and bred, so it was a little bit harder for him to make that adjustment. I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, but you know, the food scene in Madison's pretty darn good, very comparable and stuff. The art scene's really great. So we've actually been able to find our groove now that we're here. So it's good. What are some of the things that have stood out to you? I love Momoka. It's just one of my favorite places to go. I was I always used to joke that the Art Institute of Chicago was my second church. Like that was, yeah. you know, that's Mecca for me. Like going there and spending time there. So it was nice to find something that's smaller, but still gets the really great caliber of art and stuff in. So that's always a lot of fun. And then we always do the art walk and we do, I go to the chase and, and the, so there's lots of good, good places to go here. So it's been nice to be able to kind of find those little hidden away places like the arts and literature laboratory. I love that place. So how did you <laughs> get started making art yourself? I would say as a kid, I was that kid. My dad is a master carpenter and okay. that was his hobby it was like, carpentry and all that stuff. And as a kid, I always had crayons in one hand and a hammer in the other and was just always <laughs> that kid going through reams of paper and coloring on the wood. Like I just did all of that kind of stuff. And I always kind of dabbled throughout school. Um, I never really took a formal art class or anything. I was very much that type A firstborn, like got to go to college, got to study, you know, really focused on that stuff. It didn't really take art classes or anything like that. It was just more of something I did on the side in my own time. Oh, really? Yeah. And then went off to school and 
started just like crafting and scrapbooking and all that kind of stuff, I think, to kind of fill that that void of not doing true art for a while. But were um, you going to school for something else while you were doing yeah, this? Yeah, I was going to school to become a teacher of the deaf. So I worked okay. in deaf education for like 10 years. So I was kind of crafting and scrapbooking and stuff. And then I had a very odd turn of events and ended up getting a job with Fiskars in Madison. It was a part-time gig that I did from home. I was a brand ambassador for them and went around and started teaching people about crafting and how to use their tools and stuff. And then they offered me a full-time gig here. So we moved. At that point, it was like, okay, crafting kind of had become my job. And so art kind of became that thing that wasn't work. And it started to kind of split. And I was doing crafting over here as work, but art on the other side as more that passion project and the fun stuff that was my way of still of being creative and getting that out that wasn't work focused and uh -huh. that day in and day out grind kind of thing. And then the last few years, I haven't been working for them and just really started to find my niche and really started to do more in the art realm and really get back to that and really embrace it and, and things. And I still do some part-time work for other companies on the craft side to help pay the bills, for me, the art's really where my heart is at this point. How did you get the part-time job that led up to that at Fiskars? Because that's not what you were starting out to do. I'm assuming it was like product use through craft of their product. Yeah. So basically what they did was I had, it's so funny, I had applied for a contest that they had a year before I got this job and I had gotten in like the top 100 of like crafters who won this little prize or whatever. Okay. And so the following year I was on their website going, I think this is about the time that year that last year that we had the applications and it said, become a Fiskars brand warrior. And I'm like, what on earth is a brand warrior? You know, like <laughs> first thing they need to that? do is change that brand title. <laughs> I know I'm like running around with scissors. I don't know, you know, very Braveheart style. I'm not sure what this is, but so I applied for it and it turned out to be, they were hiring four brand ambassadors from around the country and they were doing interviews in major cities. And since we were living in Chicago, I was lucky enough to be able to go to an interview and ended up being picked hmm. as one of their four brand ambassadors. And so for that, for two years, I worked part time from home. So I was still teaching, but then I would go out and go to their trade shows for them and work in their booth. I would go out to smaller independent craft stores and scrapbooking stores and teach them about products and teach classes and huh give away product and blog and do all of this stuff. And then their education person was leaving. And so they had an opening. And since my background was kind of this education yeah. piece of things and the crafting they had, they hired me to move to Madison and kind of take over all of their, it turned out to be more of content management and all of their in-person video online content for how to take their tools and make with them. Huh. I don't think I've ever heard of a company hiring by a contest before. That's really yeah, weird. It was what would you say is your medium and style? Because I've looked at some of your stuff and there are, I mean, we've spoke of crafts now, but you also do drawing and you have some painting videos. I would say at this point, it's kind of evolved over the last few years. And I've really gotten to the point where I've kind of tried to split them out and really kind of separate them where before it was kind of this mesh of craft and art. And now I'm trying to separate more. And I would say at this point, it's much more mixed media, very abstract kind of stuff with a lot of, I'll paint on wood. I paint on canvas, on paper. I use a lot of acrylic, primarily some watercolors here and there, a lot of pen and ink with like some doodling and some markings and things like that. It's kind of evolved over, I would say the last six months, I've kind of changed a little bit and really started to explore more down that abstract road and less commercial kind of cutesy stuff, which is kind of where I started when I was dabbling into art, kind of more cutesy little things. And now I'm, I'm breaking off from that and doing more really abstract play at this point is what I would call it. You're even splitting your website into two groups. I think mm -hmm. you said, yeah, I've had the same blog now for, Oh gosh, years. And it, it gets to a point where it's kind of like I kind of came to this epiphany at like earlier this year that my art wasn't going to be as crafty and is like, here's mixed media and here's how you can do it at home, which was a lot of what I was doing. Like, mm -hmm. take this and I can show you how to make a project and here's how you can do mixed media. And I've taught classes around Madison and all over. I was really getting into this art for me, like my art, like this is what I really want to do for me and how I want to express myself. Mm -hmm. And I was finding that crafters 
don't they're kind of like ooh that's art like that's you're going a little farther than really where i want to be yeah and artists are kind of like wow she makes cr- christmas cards and teaches you how yeah and so the, okay. there was kind of this line that i found where i have diff- i had different pockets of people and some of what i was doing really spoke to them and some of it didn't and so i kind of decided to split them down the middle they now have totally different names different websites different Hmm. everything to kind of put art over here in its own bucket of like this is me the artist and this is what i do for art and if it sells great if it doesn't it's still this is my heart this is where my true passion is Mm -hmm. and i wanted to really focus on that where craft is kind of right now how i make a living and it's fun and i love it but it's a totally different pocket of people for me because i still have people from when i worked at fiskars that follow me and they're really paper crafters and scrapbookers and card makers, which is great, but they don't necessarily get right. the art side of it. It's been an interesting process over the last few months, kind of splitting out the business and saying, okay, I'm going to really focus on craft here and I'm going to focus on art over here. It makes sense. I suppose if people are coming to learn, you may have been may have been more detrimental in going, okay, maybe today you show up and it's going to be about painting and you didn't want to learn that, or today it's going to be about crafts and some artists didn't want that makes sense once you say it it's like okay i get that and then the blog like my blog where i talk about my life and my kids and show them how to make a project all of that's on the craft side of things which is kind of where i since that's where i started and that's where the bulk of my followers have been that's where i left all of that so that i could kind of better focus my energies on the two different groups what made you decide to do kind of a blog in that way to actually kind of show family and home life and creating crafts? It started with Fiskars because really what they wanted us to do was blog about here's crafting and here's life. But a lot of it was scrapbooking. And when you're scrapbooking, you're talking about your family. You're talking about what's going on at home. The thing that we heard all along was we were Fisketeers first. We were employees second. Hmm. And so it was really talk about your family, talk about what's going on in your life because they want They wanted us to make this real human connection Mm -hmm. with people and not just be like, here's another product, here's another tutorial. And so that's just kind of stuck with me ever since and just kind of been a part of how I blog and and who I am. It's funny that that's what they taught you because at some point, and it sounds like you had this realization too, it's like, well, why am I doing this for you? Yeah. And it was, and we got paid. So it wasn't like putting in 15, 20 hours a week and and doing it for free. They paid us well to, to do this. But there did come a point where it's like, okay, I, I'm ready to do this for me and and kind of grow it on my own. A lot of people I talk to, that's the hardest part is to put themselves out there personally. You kind of got a jumping point on the expressing yourself and putting yourself out there sort of thing. Yeah, it was when I look back at it, I mean, what I learned from that, you couldn't, you, you can't teach that in a college class at this point in time. I mean, the, the on the job training, I always joke, I kind of got like my social media degree, <laughs> my MBA, like all this stuff happened while working for them, both as an external person and internally. It was just, it was a really great opportunity for me to learn and to grow. And and it was fun to be at the starting point of all the social media stuff and just watch how it just has exploded over the years and really be there when it started. How did you find inspiration of your more artistic ventures? I was teaching full time. And then working for them about 20 hours a week and had two little boys at home. So my creative time was that paid time working for Fiskars because it just was a lot going on with toddlers and and Mm -hmm. everything else. And then once we moved up here and it kind of settled down and I just had one job, then I could start kind of playing around with stuff at home and finding more time to just enjoy it. And when we moved here, commandeered the furnace room. I have the furnace and the... um, hot water heater in my creative space, but I also have two Ikea chandeliers. So I joke that I have the fanciest (laughs) fanciest, uh, furnace room in all of Wisconsin. And that became my space. And so then I actually had a dedicated place where I could work. And if something spilled on the cement floor, I didn't care. You know, it was just one of those things. And so I've slowly been able to kind of branch out and just try different things. And the other benefit of kind of being in the crafting industry was I watched it change and watched it morph and kind of go from being super scrapbooking driven and independent stores to the major chain stores taking on a lot of that and watching the trends change um, and stuff. And I got to go to all the different trade shows Mm. and I got exposed to 
other things, which is really cool. Like you would go and you'd be like, what's the latest and greatest? And suddenly somebody is out there doing mixed media. And suddenly there's people there that aren't just doing paper crafting and they're selling canvases and they're selling wood and you can sit down and learn from them and you can start to play and, and really dabble in different things and have fun with it. How do you get involved in these trade shows? For me, it was the craft and how so Fiskars was a member. And so we would go and set up a booth oh. and then staff would go and staff the booth. We'd also have time to kind of walk the show floor and see what's going on. And I made a lot of friends that worked at all these different companies and I still have them that I'm really grateful for. And so we learned from each other and I would teach them about what we had coming out and they'd show me what they had coming out and oh. how we could take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and kind of start putting it together and it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot from them and from the experiences of just jumping in and saying, oh, what's that? And show me how it works. Teach me about it. And, and learned a lot that way. The Vintage Freight, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, is that a storefront? But then when I read more about it, it's like, no, that's an LLC that you created of yourself. So what made you decide to do that? When I started doing a lot more freelance stuff. So the LLC is actually my crafty adventures. And so, cause it started oh, okay. out as really crafting stuff, but I have a DBA as the vintage Prairie. So the vintage Prairie, when we split everything out, the vintage Prairie became the art part of it. So that is really where all of my art lives is at the vintage Prairie.com. And so we've got a new logo. Now we've got all sorts of new stuff going on over there to just kind of say, that this is the art piece of it. And then My Crafty Adventures, of course, then became the craft portion of it. And so all of the blog stuff lives there. All my payment and things flow into the LLC just to kind of keep all the books in one spot. I have two separate sites, but then my books go that way. And then I have a lot of friends who do a lot of freelance work as well. So they are freelance writers for different companies or crafters or artists for different companies. And they've found that that's the best way from a bookkeeping perspective for them is to set up the LLC and kind of have it be their business piece of it. And it just gives you a little bit of protection as a business owner to kind of do that. And so I did that Oh, well, before I left Fiskars. I did that because I started doing more freelance work and things. And so it was just nice to be able to kind of separate it out for us as a family. How hard was it for you to do that? Because I know I've tried looking into a DBA before, just in case people don't know that's doing business as. So if you're say company is named Mickey Mouse, which of course it's not going to be. But just as an example, if people write the check out to Mickey Mouse, you can cash it. Well, and I even set up separate bank accounts. So I have a separate banking account for my business. So I went and set that up. It's even at a different bank than what we bank at. So the LLC in Wisconsin oh. is very easy to do. The really? setting of an LLC and it's not super expensive. I did it all on my own online and was able to navigate my way through it without too much issue. And I just did it all online and mailed in what I needed to mail in. Oh, okay. Well then, so basically I just didn't follow through when I first looked at it. It's probably a lot easier <laughs> than I think it is. I saw a bunch of words and I was like, I'll check this out later. So I should continue to look into that. And yeah, and to be able to set up the business account, you had to have paperwork showing the business. So you have to have an EIN number, which is right. like the business version of a social security number for people who don't know what that is. Okay. And so you need that to set up the separate account. So that's what I, that's why I did all of that was so that I could separate the finances and have the business over in one spot and family in another. How do you promote yourself? You've got videos, you've got a video channel. You also have a very active Pinterest board, which I was super impressed by. <laughs> How do you promote all that? I use Instagram. I now have two separate accounts there, one for my crafty adventures. So it's really craft focused. Mm. And then my own personal one, but that's family and art. So that one's kind of me and the Vintage Prairie together there. Because I don't have a blog on the art side of it, I thought this is a good way for artists to get to know me as a person without having to do a blog and everything else over there. So oh, that okay. on that one, I show myself and my art. And then the My Crafty Adventures is new. I just started it probably less than a month ago and kind of split out some of the craft stuff over there. And right now you'll see a little overlap because I'm still showing some of the people who have been following me for a long time as myself, like, Hey, if you go over here, you'll see some craft projects. So I'm starting to slowly kind of separate them out on Instagram. I'm a big believer in the power of Instagram. I'm not really doing a lot on Twitter at this point. Facebook, I have my personal page for myself and then I have one for each 
entity. So I have one for Minecraft Adventures and one for the Vintage Prairie. My hope is to start putting a little bit of an investment in there and to running some ads okay. down the road, but we're not we're not there yet. Pinterest is one of those things that it's it's like a black hole once you're in there, you just don't <laughs> want to go back out because you just get sucked in and it's so much fun. Uh-huh. So yeah, I have a pretty intense Pinterest board, but I'm not on there a lot because when I go in there, I'm like, okay, I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to pin something. And oh, five really? hours later, I'm digging out of the hole going, I got sucked in again. Wow. It's just so pretty. I use MailChimp and I have dedicated emails and stuff like that okay. that I've been doing off and on on the craft side. Um, and I'm just getting that started on the art side. I'll use email to kind of talk about stuff that's going on, or I've done um, some classes on creative live. And so they were having a sale of like all of their classes. And so I sent out an email to all of my followers saying all their classes are 20% off or whatever it might be, but that just kind of keeps them in the loop and remembering that I'm out there so that maybe they pop over and check out the website and see what's going on. I think Instagram for me in Madison has probably been the best. Like I get the most responses on two things and what's going on in Madison from Instagram. And I like the idea of you using that as a blog because you already maintain one for the other side and then going, well, this is going to be how I'm going to blog for my artistic ventures. It's such a visual medium and with the art pieces a lot of times that's really all it is it's like here's this piece i created and if you want to know more you can go to my website and check it out but for me it's it's fun because i can be working on a piece and take a snap of it in progress and then you can do video on there you can do all sorts of things on there now that just make it so easy to kind of share that journey of a piece that you're working on do you use the stories at all the stories option yeah sometimes like if i'm really in the middle of something like a a bigger piece or a bigger project then i'll i'll do that um the only thing i don't like about that is that it disappears so if somebody hasn't been on for 24 hours and that's gone so what i'll do sometimes is just put like i've been building my vinyl collection like a true hipster oh there you go you know and so like i'll throw on one day it'll be elton john's greatest hits and so i'll have that playing the next day it's stevie nick so sometimes i'll just throw on the music that i'm listening to and a couple shots here and there but because it disappears so fast it's more of that insider little sneak peek of the weirdness that's maybe going on in my in my space you know we've been talking about crafts this whole time that's probably the one i would say artistic venture that needs lots of supplies how do you how do you get all those supplies if like that's not cheap like right you you always need a little something I got really lucky because I had a lot of friends and so you would trade stuff like I would send them some scissors they would send me what I needed so oh. over the years I built up a little stash of stuff with product trades here and there now it's I, I have to think about like what am I gonna go do what's you know what do I need to make this time what's what's the project gonna be? I grab my coupons and go hit the stores. The nice thing is once you have a base of supplies and tools, Mm -hmm. it's just like paper and stuff like that, that starts to, to add up after a while. Cause once you have your basic toolkit, that pretty much stays the same. Once you make that initial investment, which can be pricey, but that's why I said the coupons are great. You know, you just watch the sales and go, okay, I know I want that, but I'm going to wait for it. Yeah. The other thing is there's always like now when I started, that's what you did the most. But now with Craigslist and all those other things, it's right. like somebody's always getting rid of stuff. <laughs> I mean, they're like, oh, I tried it and I hated it. And now they're, you know, onto their next thing. And so they're trying to get rid of all this stuff. I know that um, Evolution Art Studio, like right now is doing, they're doing a big sale. So they're, you know, mm. they'll have people come in and donate used products and so they'll they'll do a sale one one thousand is also doing like a crafter sale too where you can bring in like if you've got tons of yarn that you want to get rid of it's like five dollars i think to set up your stuff and then it's other crafters come in and makers come in and they will shop from each other from each other's stashes of the stuff that they have and so it's just and it's that's nice because it's a good way to meet other people and kind of see what else is going on in the community but you're getting stuff then at a discount of like Here's a sheet of stickers. I used all the E's. Would you like the rest of the alphabet kind of thing? You know, like, yeah, Madison does a good job with some of those kinds of things where you've got these different events where makers can come together and swap product and stuff. Those are all great tips. I like all those. You, you, <laughs> I'm writing things down so I can go, oh, I got to check that out. I got to check that out. I really did like the idea that Stephanie brought up 
about how she uses Instagram, listening back to it. Instagram makes sense until you try to describe it to someone. Even being tech savvy, I didn't really get it. You can kind of hear me in the interview come to a realization. It's a photo blog. That's what the stories thing is. The whole it goes away in 24 hours thing, I get that because people will meticulously like a Pinterest board, make sure that their photos are pretty and displayed the way they want on the page. The stories thing is to blog. They're supposed to be dirty. They're supposed to be quick. They're supposed to be, or at least that's my interpretation. That's what I got from it. And that made a lot of sense. So I use Instagram a lot more now. I want to thank Stephanie for being on the show today. You can visit both of her sites at mycraftyadventures.com or vintageprairiehome.com. Now, as I said, there's going to be a short break. I may still be putting some things out, and I hope to not have much downtime. I hope to be out in November. If you want to hear about when the new season comes out so you don't miss it, follow us on Facebook, or you can subscribe on the website at americanbandito.com slash subscribe. There will be the options for subscribing to the podcast or sign up for the email. The music for the show is by my side project, Romcom. That's com with two M's. And you can listen to both of the songs that you've heard in today's show at AmericanBandito.com slash music. And along with that, I've written some new music that I may use. You can hear that in the background, or you can hear it on the website. The second season will be out soon. And like I've said before, there's a lot more people to meet. So I'll see you next time. So long. Oh, 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 o